what is 735 p.m. on Monday, July 19th, 2021. Uh, this is um, a scheduled hearing for the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'd like to call this meeting of the board to order. Um, I'd like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present uh, from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Kevin Mills. Here. Aaron Ford. Here. And Stephen Revelack. Here. Wonderful. Thank you all. Uh, on behalf of the town, I know Rick Ballarelli will be joining us later on, but Vincent Lee is, in, is here. I might have stepped away for a sec. Um, Rezzy Kelly Landema is here. Here. To you. Um, Consultants to the board, uh, Paul Haverty. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. And from Beta Group, I know we have three people are here. Uh, Laura Krauss is here. Bill McGrath is here. And um, Tyler DeRuder as well, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then on behalf of 1165 RMS Ave, uh, Mary Wynn Stanley O'Connor is here. Yes, good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. I know a wide variety of folks from your team are here as well. Correct. Perfect. <clears> okay, <throat> hey, so this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act in extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency, signed into law on June 16th, 2021. This act includes an extension until April 1st, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed to continue to participate remotely. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access is listed on the agenda posted to the town's website identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and is being broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Others are participating by audio or phone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. As chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. <clears throat> We do only have one item on our agenda this evening. That's the continued hearing for 1165 R Massachusetts Avenue. Um, before we begin, I just have a few comments to read through. <clears throat> uh, so the initial application for a comprehensive permit for 1165 R Massachusetts Avenue was filed with the Zoning Board of Appeals in December 1st, 2020. The application was based on a project eligibility letter issued by Mass Housing on November 17th, 2020. The first public hearing of this project was held on January 5th, 2021 over Zoom. At that hearing, the, bo the board chose to not assert safe harbor under 760 CMR 5603. Safe harbor would preclude the applicant from appealing the decision to the, of the board to the State Housing Appeals Committee. The board had asserted safe harbor in regards to the comprehensive permit application for Thorndike Place. While the town has not been successful in defending that assertion in that case, Final determination on whether the town qualifies for safe harbor has been stayed until after the decision of the board on that matter is finalized. Under state law, the board can only reach one of three decisions in regards to a comprehensive permit application. First, the board can deny the application. It must be understood that this does not mean that the project cannot or will not be built. The applicant can appeal the decision to the Housing Appeals Committee, and if they determine that the board's decision does not address the town's requirements under state law, to provide sufficient affordable housing, the board's decision can be reversed. This would allow the applicant to seek approval for not only the current proposal, but any of their prior pr proposals put before the board. 
A denial also limits the public's right to an appeal based on the project not being consistent with local needs. Secondly, the board can approve a project without conditions. I believe the board would consider such a decision if the applicant, the town, and the residents were unanimously in favor of the project without condition or objection. The board's third option is to approve the project with conditions. Under state law, the board may impose conditions on the project that are similar to conditions imposed on similar projects if they serve to address the issues of health, safety, and welfare. And the conditions do not create such a large imposition that the project is rendered uneconomic. The applicant reserves their right to appeal the decision to the Housing Appeals Committee, and the public retains their rights to appeal based on the project not being consistent with local needs. The board does not have unlimited discretion in imposing conditions on the project. The board is limited to conditions that would regularly be applied to similar projects under the regular application process. The board is also limited to conditions that address local concerns regarding health, safety, and welfare. We may not impose restrictions on business practices, personal matters, personnel matters, and similar operational concerns. We have discussed several of these topics, but we are only allowed to consider how those may impact the health and safety of the neighborhood. The Zoning Board of Appeals has held six public hearings on this project, this being the seventh. I believe the board has taken public testimony at every hearing. Perspectives expressed by the residents of this neighborhood and the town in general have been highly informative, and we greatly appreciate the input. The level of experience and expertise that the residents have brought to the hearings has been remarkable and their passion is well noted. Well, we are now coming to the end of the public hearings. I'd like to take a few minutes to clarify what the applicant is proposing, what aspects of the project are within the board's discretion to condition. We'll then begin the review of the draft decision prepared by our legal consultant with proposed amendments from the applicant, the board's consulting engineers, the conservation commission, and other town staff. Please note the draft before us does not necessarily represent the opinion of the board, nor should it be considered the final document. It is the first framework of a possible decision. <clears throat> the applicant is proposing to demolish one building west of Millbrook and portions of other buildings east of Millbrook. They're proposing to construct a new four-story residential apartment building with parking below west of Millbrook. This building will include 13 parking spaces in the lowest level and four bike parking spaces outside. There will be four residential units on the first floor, five on the second, and excuse me, then five units on each of the three remaining floors for a total of 19 units. The remaining buildings east of Millbrook will be expanded with the addition of a six-story residential apartment building with parking below. There will be 97 covered parking spaces distributed on two floors with an additional seven long-term and 11 short-term surface spaces. There'll be 114 interior bicycle parking spaces and 22 exterior bicycle parking spaces. There will be six residential units on the first floor, seven on the second, 27 on each of the third and fourth floors and 19 on each of the fifth and sixth floors for a total of 105 units. The proposed location for <clears throat> The six-story building requires relocation of Ryder Brook and intermittent stream. Almost the entire site is within the 200-foot riverfront protection area. However, the existence and reuse of a historic mill building on the site provides an exception to that regulation. The applicant has cooperated with the Conservation Commission and Beta Group to address the wetland issues. The applicant proposes to have automobile traffic enter from Massachusetts Avenue using an existing right-of-way and exit via Ryder Street, private way. Bicycles can both enter and exit from both Massachusetts Avenue and Ryder Street. Exiting automobile traffic, exiting to Ryder Street must turn left towards Forest Street and avoid driving through the adjacent residential neighborhood. Traffic heading west towards Massachusetts Avenue must utilize an interior street to reach Quinn Road, but may not exit back along the entrance drive. There are several concerns regarding offsite parking, location of a utility pole along the entrance drive and construction operations. It will be up to the board to determine how these issues are weighed relative to local needs and how they are addressed in the decision. For tonight's discussion, the board would like to look first at the sections of the draft decision where there are differences between the applicant and the town. We'll then take up sections requested by the board followed by public comment. The board anticipates continuing tonight's hearing to allow for more detailed comment to be submitted in writing and for the draft to be further revised. The board does indeed, excuse me, <clears throat> the board does intend to close the public hearing at the following hearing, which will, would be the last opportunity for the board to receive additional outside information before it begins its internal deliberation. The board looks forward to a productive evening. We thank everyone for their patience and contribution. With that in mind, <clears throat> I will go ahead and uh, bring up on the screen our current draft. Okay, 
So this was posted um, to the agenda. I believe it was posted uh, today. I apologize for the for the late posting. Um, as you'll be able to see from the coloring, there are a variety of different um, authors at this point. Um, so it's a little bit uh, complicated. Um, for those of you who have who are new to the this process, who haven't seen one of these decisions before, um, <clears throat> so the, it's broken up into the several sections. The first is the procedural history, which includes um, sort of all the submittals and the background information for the project. Um, the applicant is, who's representing the applicant, who's representing the board, um, and those kinds of things. And the second section is jurisdictional findings, and this is sort of legal determinations, uh, particularly around the, the filing of the application with the state um, and its certification. And the third is the factual findings. Um, and so this is the, the section where we outline exactly what we have determined through the course of the hearings. Um, so there will be a lot of information here, but we'll be adding to this as we go along. Um, and then we get into the conditions and the conditions are where we, um, we dictate a little bit more strongly what the applicant is to do. And this is broken also into different sections. Um, the, the general section is just about basically about what documentations have been submitted, what are the controlling documents that are gonna be a part of the decision um, and anything that is of a sort of general nature. Then we have the affordability section with addresses specifically the affordability aspects and also includes um, <clears throat> you know, some of the some of the aspects around who is eligible for the project, the submission requirements, is how they apply for the application, the final applications from the town, uh, construction completion, closing out the project, project design and construction is where we have much more detail about how the project is to be designed and what are the very specific requirements, uh, traffic, traffic safety conditions, uh, police, fire, emergency, medical conditions, water, sewer, and utilities, uh, wetlands, floodplain, environmental conditions, a large section on this project because of its location and other general conditions to apply to the project and then the final decision and a record of the vote. And then um, I just want to ask uh, Paul Haverty, Paul, we, we typically would include the list of requested waivers as an appendix. Is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Chairman. No. <clears throat> so unless there is an objection, I was going to recommend we sort of try to hit first off the, the areas where it looks like there's a lot of comment uh, being provided either by the applicant or by the um, by the by beta group or the conservation commission or the, the town itself. So um, the submission under the submission requirements, um, if there was a question. Um, Meeting to the board, I think that was on. There's a question about the plantings. Um, and I believe these comments are uh, from the town. Kelly, do you re recall if these are? Um, these were, I believe, comments um, by F Emily Sullivan on behalf of the Conservation Commission. Oh, okay. Um, um, Emily is here, and she can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Emily, if you would like to. Hi, Kelly. Um, yeah, Chris. So, yeah, I I, uh, I added those. Perfect. Okay, so this extends. From 12 months to essentially to 36 months to confirm the survival rate of the plantings. Um, we we have no problem with that, Mr. Chairman. 
the issue was non-cultivar species. And um, Emily, according to our landscape architect, Kyle Zick, um, cultivar species are gonna need to be used to develop that um, design that was presented to the Conservation Commission. So Mary, I, I know the commission did review the planting plan and they didn't have any issues with it. So I'd say as long as um, the plan conform or what's planted conforms to the plan, I think we're all set. But um, if there turns out to be some replacement species needed, uh, I think the commission is certainly willing to, to have a conversation if needed. So, so maybe what we could do if Mr. Chairman is mm -hmm. that the applicant shall um, implement the planting plan approved by the Conservation Commission. Would that do it, Emily? That would be wonderful. Thank you. And then those are um, here under section H. This is the question about the, the inflow and filtration fees. And uh, Kelly, just to confirm with you, uh, these these fees are the ones that um, are not from a fee schedule, but they were recommended to be imposed by the engineering division. Yeah, they were sort of recommended as a best practice or something to potentially be implemented, but we don't have a, um, a standard fee schedule for those. So we are. Um, suggesting that they not be required. Okay. That's the same language again. Um, and then the under J, so I believe, and Mary, this is from, this changes from your office, is that correct? Yes. That um, what is we are intending to do is submit to the building inspector an author survey plan for approval not required, uh, splitting off the work bar site from the uh, 40B project, and we will be coming before the board on a shared parking agreement under the zoning bylaw. So, is I know we, we did sort of touch base on this earlier today, but just to clarify, so. Is the board being asked to approve the subdivision as a part of this pro this application? Uh, no, the board um, is only being asked to uh, state that the 40B site will comport with the zoning requirements of this decision so that the building inspector doesn't have an issue when he looks at the um, NO, uh, well, the approval not required plan. Okay. But, but is the the approval not required plan then going to be endorsed by the planning board? Um, it does not need to be endorsed by the planning board. What they do need to do is they need to review a shared uh, park, parking agreement under the bylaw. I, I'm a little bit confused. How, how, how are you getting your approval not required plan endorsed? Then? The building inspector, I went through with this with Doug Heim. The building inspector is the one that has the authority. There's no um, a commercial subdivision approval in Arlington, okay. only residential. But the bylaw, asking, well, the bylaw- You're not does, asking the Board of Appeals to certify that the remainder lot um, is going to comply with zoning, right? Only we, we are not, we are okay. not. All right, well, that's fine. And Mary, you had crossed out um, the request to, for test fit to confirm groundwater elevations? Um, my understanding is that um, my, my team felt that this came from a different project and it wasn't applicable here. Um, they have done whatever tests need to be done. Um, if I could ask uh, Emily Sullivan if this is something that she thinks would be required or Bill McGrath. If... Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, Bill McGrath with beta. Um, yeah, no, I think uh, this is something uh, from another project. In, in this case, uh, we, we didn't have issues with groundwater. So I don't think this is a, a requirement that the, the board needs to have in the, the approval. Perfect. Thank you. 
E6, um, applicant shall work with the Arlington Open Space Committee and Arlington Historic Commission on development of interpretive signage. Um, I believe that was an addition after, uh, on behalf of the town. Kelly, can you speak to that condition? Yes, yes. Yeah. So earlier in this process, I believe at one of the first hearings, there was a discussion about interpretive signage being located along the Millbrook um, as, uh, as is recommended in the Millbrook Corridor Report. Um, there was, um, there was a call out to interpretive signage on that plan dated June 16, 2020, and it has since disappeared. Um, and so that is something that based on, it's, it would just be a sign or something indicating the location of the mill brook and the historic nature of, um, like the historic nature of the mill complexes in Arlington. That is not an issue, that's fine. Perfect. It may have been lost when um, the, the location of the path was adjusted. Okay. Thank you. I know E8 was a carryover from a prior project and was not a part of this application. Um, I, would ask, I guess I'd ask Bill McGrath again, um, if there's any concerns about um, confirming soil types in the area of the infiltration system. I don't think we have an infiltration system here. Is that no, correct? No, there's no infiltration system. Okay. That's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> So in regards to the vibration monitoring, um, so, uh, as Mary O'Connor, if you could speak to what this change does from the prior language. We wanted to make it clearer that we'd submit the plan as to what we were gonna do rather than uh, visiting homes individually with, represent with a representative from the town. Okay. So you're monitoring for, then, then do you have any issue with the prior E29? No. Okay, perfect. We will, my client will also be monitoring the building that's remaining because that has a stone foundation. Ah, okay. E31 is just further clarification about the truck paths. E32 is about pest control. Um, section F. There's anything major in F. Um, it's just a change for the elevators from generator to battery backup. Under Mass State Law. Okay. So, so the G6, so the project shall maintain fire access to all four sides of each residential structure at all times as shown on the approved plans. Does is there access around the back side? I'm assuming the access to two of the back sides is from adjacent properties. Is that correct? Or is it I, I will ask Randy Marin who's on the call. Thank you. Thank you. So oh, I guess when we speak about fire access, are we talking about access for fire department personnel or fire a fire apparatus? Well, I guess that's something that's going to have to be determined specifically by the fire department in their review. Yep. Um, but I just want to make sure that you're you're comfortable with the with the level of access to the, the sides of the building that don't have driveways on them, because really there's only a paved drive on one side of the the primary building. Right. Yeah. I think the fire department looked at this and approved it, didn't they, Randy? 
They did, yeah. That, that was just a mistake. So we okay. do have an email from uh, the, the deputy fire chief stating that he's okay with the fire department access shown on the on basically on the um, current plans. Perfect. Right, thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. Uh, this is Pat. I just it does say on all four sides as shown on the approved plans. And I guess the question that I had is whether the approved plans in fact shows access on all four sides. That wasn't clear from the conversation that you just had. Chairman Klein, if I may, we did review this plan with the fire department and it, it's my understanding, Joel Bargman, our architect might be able to articulate this a little bit more sharply than me, but the fire department doesn't need to have driving access around the perimeter of your building. The it needs to have access to get the vehicles a certain distance away so that um, they have access to all sides of the building, um, not only with driving their vehicles up, but having man access with their hoses and whatnot. So uh, if Joel, I don't, Joel, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but if you have that, if you can articulate that more sharply, it would be appreciated. But this was, a, a conversation we did have with the fire department and was reviewed and we got documentation that they reviewed it and were, were, were good to go. My, my interest here isn't so much is, 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 is not that substantive actually from what you've described language saying the project shall maintain fire access at all times to the each residential structure at all times as shown on the approved plans would give you everything you needed to do. I'm, I'm just worried that it'll turn out that somebody will say that there's a contradiction there because the approved plans don't really show access, fire access to all four sides. And the issue is just that it doesn't need to. And just from the point of view of avoiding interpretive issues later on, what is the reference to all four sides add to the as shown on the approved plans? Good point, Pat. Yeah. Yeah, I, again, I think it's fire. The project we'll just take the fire. Sides. <clears throat> Go ahead, Joel. I was going to say that you, you don't have to provide it. You have to provide it within 250 feet of every side. So couldn't we just say provide fire access required by the building code? So, and so that's what I'll, I will actually revise this to include the reference to the state building code provision requiring fire access. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sounds Thanks, great. Paul. You're that welcome. dimension changes. So if we could just keep it generic to the building department, the, the dimension changes depending on what li other life safety systems are in the building. And so mm -hmm. to avoid getting caught, if we just reference the building code requirement, I think that would be the best. Um, G8. Um, so kind of parts of the way the language works now. So during construction, the project shall have a superintendent on site during working hours to address security concerns with the police department. So is there any, is there a, an access, any kind of an access system? Well, I guess it, it's, it's more sort of an operational question for how the, it, the project, the site would be used in terms of whether or not there's a um, a card access system, I don't know if the, the board. We can come back to this question as to whether the board thinks it's important to include something in regards to access after the construction is is complete. There's more fire. According uh, to approved plans. So in, in a case like H1 here, where it's in accordance with the approved plans, is it the plans that are approved by this board or the plans that are approved upon final submittal to the building inspector? Well, we were referring to the plans that were submitted, correct, Randy, so far? And Joel? Yeah, correct. Approved plans is actually a defined term. Uh, mm -hmm. So we should probably, Paul, cap approved and plans in H1. 
because they're lowercase and hmm. well with the, the the defined term approved plans are those the plans the board is going to be correct the, the, those are the plans that the board is approving in the issuance of the comprehensive permit and okay. the applicant has to submit final plans in the mm -hmm. different defined term and those okay. are the plans that get submitted with all of the additional detail after the process has been completed Okay. And if the town requires changes to the final plans, does that impact this at all? If, if, it, re, if it requires changes to the final plans with regards to what issue? With regards to water and sewer and utilities? Well, just where it, I mean, it, we're it, saying here that, the, that they're responsible for the design as in accordance with the approved plans, but if the town comes back and decides that they they want to do something slightly different how does that impact the decision well i mean the, the these plans are being approved so yeah. this is what should be the basis for the final plans that are submitted mm -hmm. if the applicant wants to make a change with what has already been proposed and they have to go through the modification process okay but the town should not be asking for something different mm -hmm. than was already approved by the board. Now, if in the process of submitting additional information, you know, an issue arises, then you know, we can go through that and, and go okay. through the modification process. Okay. And utilities, and just to confirm, um, with the applicant, so the, the utilities that are serving um, the buildings east of Millbrook, those are being run underground from the pole at Ryder Street, is that correct? Randy, can you answer that please? Hang on, so, Chairman Klein, you met, you said east, the building. So the, the, the new six story building, to so that side of, the, is that being, that's being served, I believe it's coming underground from Ryder Street. That's correct. Okay. Yep. And then the the work bar and the new building number two, those will be both served overhead from the Mass Ave line. Correct for the electric service. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Well, look, just to be clear, the work bar is going to be backfed to be served underground. So the is the pole remaining that's in front of work bar? <laughs> um, the the pole that remains in the driveway remains correct, but the electric service to to work bar will come off of the new underground service um, that is serving the eastern side and then crossing over the brook. Ah, okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, so this brings us to section I about wetlands, uh, floodplains, and environmental conditions. Um, now, if I can give you the reason on one I two I three and I four, I my assistant sent Paul and Pat and you Christian mm -hmm. uh, that attachment that showed the whole the site is nearly all aura, so it would be virtually impossible um, uh, to agree to these three provisions. Um, so I would reach out to um, <coughs> Emily if you want to addresses how the town has dealt with these kinds of issues in the past, if you're aware. Yeah, uh, so Christian, in, in the past, uh, when a project in an environmental resource area is, is fully within a resource area and there needs to be stockpiling or dumpsters, we just like to make sure that uh, erosion controls are placed such that any stockpiles, you know, they won't, um, you know, flow into, let's say, Millbrook. So I guess one way to resolve not having any of these three conditions in this draft decision would just be to make sure um, there's a pre-construction meeting where erosion controls are checked and then um, dumpsters are covered uh, at the end of the day. And then uh, we would recommend that no equipment um, is refueled in resource areas, or if so, there's some sort of secondary uh, containment so that um, no fuel uh, enters resource areas like Millbrook. Thank you. Um, Mary, does that sound satisfactory to you? Yeah, that's, that's I believe that's reasonable. Perfect, yes. Okay. 
Uh, so I six was added by the town, Mary. I wasn't sure. And I had sent in my letter just one minor change to I six at the beginning. Um, we propose adding while no dewatering operations are anticipated by the applicant, comma, any water discharge as part of any dewatering watering operation, et cetera. Okay. Okay, then I seven. Um, so this is the hiring of a qualified environmental monitor with professional credentials. Uh, this looked like it came from another decision. Reach out to, <clears throat> to Emily. Um, is this a typical thing that the that the uh, the town will require, or is this from something else? So the, the Conservation Commission usually requires a, a professional uh, environmental monitor for more complex projects. So we've used this, uh, for example, at uh, the high school DPW when we the commission permitted that. We've also done a few of uh, uh, more residential developments, like single family homes, when we feel like it's been complicated. Um, I know this is going to be a big project. There are going to be a lot of folks with eyes on the site. And so I think the commission would be comfortable with having some sort of monitor. Uh, and I, I think monitor might be listed uh, several times in this, you know, in terms of stormwater monitor and stuff like that too. Um, but usually we find something like this can be beneficial um, during a complex project. Okay. Mary, is the, is the objection to any kind of monitoring or just? Well, we thought this paragraph was pretty in, uh, intensive. Okay. I, because there's requesting that electronic reports be submitted weekly to the ZBA. And I, I didn't, that's not what I'm hearing from Emily. Um, are there any questions from the board about this particular question? Mr. Chairman. Yes, Pat. Um, just as a, it's not really a question. Um, it seems to me that there's some, that, that there really, that the, there's not as much of a disagreement as the language suggests. And I have a feeling that if we could just articulate, Emily and Mary uh, could articulate what it is they're looking for. I don't think that they're very far apart and they could just work out the exact language with Mr. Hammer. Okay. Well said, thank you. Chairman Klein. Yes, please. This is Susan Chapnick, yeah. Chair yeah. of the Conservation Commission, if I may just comment. Please. Thank you. Um, the intent is exactly as Emily said, is for complex projects, um, this is always a requirement. In terms of the frequency of reporting, that's always um, nego you know, negotiable and specific to the complexity and what's, what's happening um, and, the, and the chances that the Conservation Commission feels for, um, you know, for, for potential problems. So, so the specific issues we really worry about are rainfall. Um, there's a, there's a uh, sentence in here during the duration of the project, a qualified monitor, we're, we're concerned about what's going to happen with erosion controls during heavy rains. That's one issue. We want some kind of frequency of reporting, but one week is not necessarily a requirement. So I agree with uh, Mr. Hanlon that we could find a, you know, some wording that would be reasonable, but um, this is consistent with what the, the Conservation Commission requires on complex projects. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Contact information. Okay. Uh, so this is 
I think the original I-15, I-16. Um, the SW, Triple P, inspection reports and invasives management. Um, did that concert, Susan, did the Conservation Commission request invasives management? Yes, we did. I, respectfully, I think in, on this one, we thought uh, since there wasn't any areas of the existing site that had invasives that were going to remain, it, it, we questioned whether that really was directly applicable to our situation. So we were, we were questioning how we would actually do this. What the um, Conservation Commission is concerned about um, in these areas where there have been many invasives and where we're removing them and we're replanting um, and uh, you know restoring um, native habitat, we wanna make sure that we don't get invasives back in there. <laughs> um, this is a, a very urban area. There are a lot of invasives in the area. It's very easy for invasives to take over in native areas. So, um, and this is consistent with what we do um, request of other projects when um, they have required vegetation mitigation, that they have an invasive management um, control um, plan so that the native plants don't get overrun. Okay, I think that's consistent with our goal. So we're more than happy to put a plan together and maybe we can work with Emily and the Conservation Commission to get an example and, and provide a good product for you. Okay. Sounds great, thank you. Thank you, welcome. Um, what is an SWPPP inspection report? Storm water protection plan. Ah. Thank you, okay. Uh, and was the objection to the reporting at all, or just the, the, the frequency of the reporting? I would um, I would say that it was the frequency of reporting. Randy, you're, you can provide a report, can't you, as to this? Correct, we will be providing a SWIP document. I think it was just a little redundant with that other condition about the environmental monitoring, uh, okay. which is also asking for, um, you know, observations after every, I think, half inch rainfall. Um, which basically state that's essentially what the SWIP actually asked you to do also. Emily, are you comfortable with that? Uh, yeah, Christian, I think that's great. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I 20. This was um, put in at the request of the town. Uh, Mary, did you have any concerns about this addition? Yeah, we, we wanted to remove from there, um, from the third line, all requirements under the application for vegetation removal in accordance with section 24, E1 through E7 of the Arlington Wetlands Protection Bylaw. Uh, because we've already gone through that process. Okay. Wetlands Protection Act that applies. We have no problem providing all this information. Okay. Emily, are you comfortable with that? Uh, yeah, I think this condition is largely just a reminder that this project does have to go through another permit process through the Conservation Commission. Um, and the commission has found already through the comprehensive permit process that it largely complies with all of the commission's uh, performance standards in the wetlands regulations. Okay. So yes. Perfect, thank you. Um, this is third on the approved. Oh, this is just relocating the note to the approved plans and then adding through a recorded deed restriction. Does the applicant have an issue with the recorded deed restriction? No, no it okay. was agreed to. Perfect. Uh, the phrase is done I-23. <clears throat> um, with respect to this one, Chairman Klein, the please. concern, um, Chairman Klein and Emily and Susan, is that um, doing this work 
in the early phase is going to be a problem because of the construction that's going to go on. What we propose is revising this section to say as follows, as part of uh, the conservation, as part of the notice of intent, the Conservation Commission shall review the applicant's proposal for the scheduling of the work and she shall detail the work necessary for rerouting the Ryder Brook. Uh, and then um, talks about the work that you're providing there in A, B, and C. We propose coming to you with the notice of intent to discuss when to do this. Putting it in at the beginning is gonna present a problem because um, heavy equipment will be going over the swale, as I understand it, to put windows in um, and the like. So we don't think it should be at the front end. Laura, did you have a comment on this? Chairman Klein, yes. Yeah, so this was one of our recommended conditions. One of our, con the reason why we were concerned with the you know, the constr or the timing of the construction of the swale was that we wanted to make sure that there was still, like the flow was maintained throughout construction because currently the construction plan kind of just shows a building across where the swale is. So we just want to make sure that there's, I mean, the water needs to go somewhere. We don't want it backing up behind the build building. So some kind of way to get the water through the site during construction. So I, you know, I, I'll let uh, uh, Emily and Susan say whether or not they think it's okay to wait till the NOI, but um, as long as there's some kind of plan for, for moving the water through the site, I think that that's the, the primary concern. Laura, we could do, I believe, a temporary pipe until the swale goes in. If that works and that can you know handle the flows and there'll be no flooding upstream, I, we're, we're concerned with potential for flooding and, and you know maintaining right. the flow. So I don't know if Emily or Susan has anything else to add on that or. Emily? I think that sounds agreeable to, to go through it in the notice of intent process. Susan, are, are you comfortable with that? Susan? Um, yes, I'm comfortable with doing it then, but I, I agree with Laura that we have to have some kind of plan in place and maybe that's the uh, a temporary pipe um, because the Ryder Brook as it exists does move water, especially lately, <laughs> as we've seen with these rains um, and they have to go somewhere. Thank you all. Absolutely, Dorothy Rhodes. Okay, so those were what appeared on on a review to be sort of the larger changes, um, <clears throat> or I should say the larger additions to the decision. Um, so at this point, I'd like to reach out to the board to see if there are members of the board who have specific questions and comments in regards to the draft decision that's before us. Mr. Revelak. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I do have a few questions. Um, I'm going to have to flip through a printed copy to, in order to in order to find them. Um, and okay, so uh, can we start with in the general conditions? Uh, number B2. And this is this is more of a question than anything else. Here we go. Okay, so um, my question is regarding the last sentence. The affordable unit shall be maintained as affordable in perpetuity, which for the purposes of this decision shall mean for as long as the property does not comply with applicable zoning requirements without the vent of this comprehensive permit. Um, I'm, my, I'm sort of curious why that's limited to zoning requirements and not other um, local regulations. such as our local wetlands protection bylaws. That's a good point. Um, and we can certainly revise that to include it. Okay, very good. Um, in, I believe it's item B4, uh, where there's a, a mention of local preferences, yes. a 70% local preference. Um, yeah, 
I think this should deserves to, we've talked a little bit about local preferences in another project, but I'd, um, I'd like us as a board to dis, to have a discussion about whether uh, that is something we you know, do in fact desire. Um, and- Mr. Revelak, can I just um, uh, give some uh, information here? Uh, oh, please do. Director Rate um, had suggested 50% and a majority of the Board of Selectmen uh, had suggested 50 versus 70. That's where that number came from. Okay. And um, my other, my final quest, oh God, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Haverty. Before, this is this is Pat actually, before Mr. going Hamlet. on, uh, Ms. Connor, could you, where where is it that the Board of uh, Selectmen, when did they do that? I'd like to be able to look up what they did and what their discussion was. Um, I don't recall at what meeting. I know my memory was is Mrs. Mahan was opposed to that. She wanted the maximum um, 70 percent, but the, my memory was the other members wanted a reduced uh, percentage. And, and the, the and they settled on the 50 percent. Uh, that came from director rate, but I think they concurred with that. I see. The, the just why I would like to just sort of state for the record, Brookline has sort of taken a, a lead in addressing all of these mm -hmm. uh, issues, and they, if my memory is correct, have reduced it to 25 percent. And in a place like Arlington, with a very, very, which is very far from being an integrated community, uh, it's it's not 100% clear that's right. Mr. Haverty, this will be a decision that the board has to make, right? That is correct, Mr. Hanlon. This is entirely within the scope of the board's discretion, whether or not it wants to include a local preference requirement for up to 70%. Of course, at the end of the day, it is, it's actually the subsidizing agency that gets to determine whether or not that local preference will be imposed and to what extent it would be imposed. But if the board makes a determination that it does not believe that any local preference is appropriate, um, it would just leave it out of the decision and that would really end the matter. Right. Thank you. Mrs. McConnor. A strong would... feeling one way or the other. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, Steve. Now, uh, now, actually, Mr. Hanlon, you, um, I, I think you, you got where I, you, you stated quite well where I was, you know, kind of going with this. Um, my last question is, uh, there was a bond, one of our local bylaws has a bonding requirement for work in floodplains. And I don't see that, uh, I believe there, we discussed this during the waiver process. Um, and, you know, but there, no one, if I recall correctly, no one knew what bond amounts uh, would typically be used for a project like this. I would reach out to Emily or Susan if you have a sense of that. Susan, does this at all relate to, um that email exchange about bonds i i'm trying to recall um and christian we can look into this i'm not sure i have an answer for you right now and i i apologize for not having the <clears throat> specific section of the town bylaws um you know in front of me and uh Yeah, I, I I I apologize for not having the uh, the specific section to refer to right right off the top of my head. Sorry. Um, that is all I had, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, Mr. Evelyn. Are there other members of the board who have specific questions or general questions? <laughs> Mr. Mills. <clears throat> yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, I go back to the first part of this uh, memorandum and uh, the poll situation. I'd like to know if there's been any further negotiations on the moving of the poll or if there's any estimation what it would cost to uh, bury the poll, bury the wires. Mm -hmm. I'll defer to Mr. Mills to Mr. St. Clair on that. Thank you. Dan? 
Daniel. So we continue to try to work with the utility companies to see what options are available. Um, and um, although we don't have any clear answers yet, you know, we're hopeful that there is something that we can do um, to improve the situation with the poll. Um, so uh, I, I wish I had something more definitive to offer at, at this point, but um, you know, we, we haven't had that breakthrough yet, but we continue to try to work with the, uh, with the, utility companies to figure out what their requirements are and and define that better and, and continue to see if we can work out something um, with the abutters. I, again, the, the, the bearing of the lines, I think, is, um, um, the, although it would be nice to snap your fingers and make all this stuff dis disappear, it would cause uh, dramatic uh, and extended outages for all of the abutters. Um, and re would require uh, a lot of interior work um, to those buildings. And, uh, you know, I would just submit that in the, in the end, when people understand what the impact that has on them, you know, um, even outside of the, the cost, which would be extreme and, and fit, make our project financially uneconomic, um, you know, I, I just don't think people are going to want to do that. But we're, we're continuing to look into options to move the poll out of the way. We've heard the concerns that Mr. Anessi has, and we'd like to find a solution that um, would, would um, appease his concerns, and we're working to try to make that happen. Well, sir, uh, in my mind, I mean, there's a poll on Mass Avenue, the poll in question, then a third poll. So it seems to me tunneling from the first poll to the third poll and burying all of the uh, circuits under there would be the one route. And I know that would be expensive, but I understand there's going to be some uh, digging and burying of other lines anyway. So there'll be some excavations. And to truly assess the impact of this on costs, I think it would be good if somebody could give a ballpark estimate of what such a project would cost. Thank you. So we, we've had discussions about that and what the utility company has said is because of the different types of services that come off of uh, those utility lines, you know, there's, um, um, I'm, not, I'm not an electrical engineer, but, you know, there's single volt, there's uh, 480 and yeah. two, 270 and all of that. What they said is the current service, there's like three different types of service that come off of those poles, if they were to replace it with underground, they could not replicate that. It doesn't meet the standards. So all of the buildings would have to, the individual buildings owned by the different um, um, companies would have to have a total new electrical service put in those buildings. And, and you would end up having transformers sitting in front of all these buildings. There's just, you know, I, I don't, mean to sound difficult, but as we had those conversations that, you know, it's, it was apparent to us that, that even if you had an unlimited amount of dollars to throw at it, it was not a solution that people would really want in the end because they don't want to have the obstruction of the transformer sitting in, in front of their house, in front of their buildings. Um, the poles actually make it, um, you know, there's stuff up in the air, but at least you're not bumping into it other than the pole, uh, which I know is the concern here. So uh, we've gone back to the place where we're saying, well, let's do our best to try to get the pole out of the roadway or at least to the very edge of the roadway. We can't, we can't make the decision to put it on the Myrak Hyundai property. We can ask them and we have asked them, but we don't have all the data yet from the, um, from the utility companies as to what they would really require but we will continue to make our best effort to try to get that pole either moved to the Myrak uh, Hyundai property if they allow us to do that. And if they don't, we'll make our best effort to push it to the edge of the 20 foot right of way um, that we own and make a, a clear space of 18 and a half feet instead of 14 feet 11 as it is now. Well, sir, I appreciate that. And I would just like some more clarification. I realize there are three um, lines of very high voltage running over those wires. Are you saying by regular, it's a matter of regulatory matters, those lines could not be run underground? 
No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the services that come to the, the buildings are three different types of services. I have, and, I, if, I, yeah. and if you were to put in those services, the new modern equipment doesn't deliver those services. It delivers a more modern service. So all of the buildings that have the old standards would have to be upgraded. And so can you imagine somebody coming into your house or your business and ripping off all the electrical equipment on the wall and saying, yeah, we'll get some new panels in whenever they arrive. And, uh, you know, you having not only a disruption, but you have uh, a loss of power, a loss of business. And, you know, then suddenly maybe it, it trickles down and uh, other systems in your building are are designed to meet the old service and they don't meet the new service. So again, uh, sir, I have a hard time understanding if you're taking a piece of wire that's in the air, basically going to cut it and bury it underneath the ground. They won't. They won't put the same service in kind underground. Okay, so it's a regulatory matter then, some along that line. I don't know if it's regulatory or if it's technical. And I, again, I, I just know I've been in the, many of the meetings where we, I said the same thing. I was like, guys, why is this so hard? Let's just move the wires. And well, we don't have this. We don't have this. There's, you know, so th there are, there are challenges that we're just trying to work through that we just inherit because inherit because this is a, you know, infrastructure that's dated and is not modern to today's standards, unfortunately. Mr. Mills, Thank you. We, do, we have taken this seriously. We do have a consultant that's working with the utility companies. Uh, my client would like to move that pole, believe yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. That's all I have. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, Mr. Haverty, in terms of writing conditions, if, if the board wanted to have a condition that was, you know, if the pole can be moved, you know, that's great. If the bull, if the pole can't be moved, then we will request that the applicant do X, Y, or Z to try to um, mitigate some of the hazards. Is that something we can do some in, in a condition? We can do it in a condition. I would need some information as to what X, Y, and Z could be. Yeah. But yes, I mean, you know, we, we can put it in a condition that the applicant shall continue to work with the utility companies uh, mm -hmm. to try to find a way in which the pole can be relocated. Okay. Um, and if not, then, you know, whatever needs to be done to try to improve safety. Well, we can write a condition where it's not, you have to do this one thing, but that you could do one of these three things in order to mitigate the issue. Correct. Okay. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. There is condition uh, H9 that I think goes part of the way, at least, to what you're you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you for pointing that out. Hmm. Uh, Ms. Linema, were there any, did, has the town looked at all into the question of this poll? Yep, yeah, so we had, um, early last week, we had a conversation with Verizon about a number of issues with Verizon Poles through town. Um, Stan Yusevich, who works uh, with Verizon on regulatory issues. Um, we gave him the poll number and I sent him a photo of the poll. So he's looking into it. I followed up with him, um, I believe it was Friday and I still have not heard back. So as soon as I hear something, I will let the board know through you. Um, but at this point, I don't have an update. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if I may, um, we'd, we'd be happy to uh, try to collaborate on our efforts there. Was this uh, contact with Verizon or with uh, Eversource? It was with Verizon. So I'm, I'm happy to put him in touch with you if okay. that would be helpful. 
Well, we're happy to do that uh, or connect them through Mary, however you would like to do that. But, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a black box of an organization, but we are, I think we are making some incremental progress um, with our consultant and, you know, we'll be able to get to the bottom of whether it is feasible or not and whether the abutters will agree and, um, and we, we will certainly share our findings when, when um, we have those. So I, I think the language that's in here does kind of capture the essence of what uh, the goal is. And we, we would um, look forward to having another point of contact to try to help us get to um, the clear truth. So Chairman Klein, if, it's, if it is okay with you, I can um, email um, Barry O'Connor and CCU and um, just do an introduction to Stan at Verizon. That'd be, that'd be great, I would appreciate Thank that. You, mm -hmm. Great, Thank you. Other other comments or questions from the board in regards to the draft decision? Even did you have another? Well, no, just um, to fill in a blank that yeah. I had left earlier, uh, the bonding requirement that I was referring to is the town bylaws, Title V, Article Eight, Section Eleven. So just um, just for clarity. Okay. Is it five eight eleven? That is correct. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. No uh, other questions. Yes, Mr. Please. Chairman, one of the things that um, was left open for discussion was C one A under submission requirements. We had suggested there be a cap um, on uh, expenses associated with technical reviews and inspections. It does provide for $6,500, but then if the if um, the town feels they need additional funds. Lana, is this something you can speak to? Do you know anything about that? I'm sorry, can you please repeat the question? Sure. So this is um, so the, the for additional reviews. Um, the director of planning through the Department of Planning and Community Development, um, there are technical reviews and inspections that can be uh, it's it's additional 53G funds during the and during construction and approvals. Um, and I wasn't sure if the, how the, your department typically handles those um, because, you know, obviously the, the town has not had a, a large number of 40 Bs, um, certainly not recently. And the applicant is requesting that there be um, a not to exceed figure included. Mm -hmm. and, um, I, I cannot answer for that for you right now, but I know absolutely I'll get to it and follow up. If sure. you would, could do that, that'd be great. Thank Certainly. you. I can um, talk with um, my director tomorrow if I know. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I wondered if Mr. Haverty, just in looking at other communities that have had more uh, experience with this, could tell us a little more about what would be what would be normal here since this should arise in practically every case. Mr. Happy. Yes, sure, Mr. Chairman. So my, my concern with putting a cap on it is it obviously limits the amount of review that the board will be able to do, or that the town will be able to, to do with regard to the final plans. I, I Without having you know, sought out uh, an estimate as to, you know, first of all, what each department would be looking for, um, and then, you know, how much that might cost. I, I can't really hazard a guess as to whether or not $6,500 would be sufficient for all of the review. And I know that Arlington has a lot of in-house capability for review of plans, and that is what should be the default in the first instance 
it's really only when you're getting to areas in which you don't have the in-house in capability to review these final plans that they should be sent out for additional review. Um, but I, I really, I, I'm not comfortable at this stage saying $6,500 you know, would be the cap and that you know, there wouldn't be a need for more, which is why the condition is generally prepared you know, to allow for additional funds to be added at a later date if necessary. Mr. Haverty, we're not saying, uh, just to be clear, we're not suggesting that the 6,500 be the cap, but that some number over the 6,500 be the cap. We understand there's a 6,500, um, mm -hmm. but that's what we're talking about. Okay, and again, I, I just don't know how to set that cap at this stage, you know, without having sought out any quotes as to, you know, A, what is going to be reviewed and B, what the cost of those reviews would be. And I, I would be more comfortable, you know, with language that states that the town is going to use best efforts to minimize the use of outside consultants and rely upon town staff, um, you know, whether it be the director of planning, whether it be the engineering department. Um, you know, I, I think that that is appropriate, but I, I just don't see how you can put a number onto what that cap would be at this point in time. Thank you. Uh, Ms. O'Connor, are there other sections you'd like to bring our attention to? Um, the only other thing is that, um, Mr. Haverty, there was a supposed to be a 20% reduction in the CONCOM fees. I did put a parenthetical note in there. Um, that was the only fee that there was going to be a reduction. The Conservation Commission had voted that. Okay. I did see that. I think that captures everything, Chairman Klein. No, oh, thank you. Thank you. I do want to say that um, the applicant and I really appreciate Attorney Haverty and um, Chairman Klein and the board getting us the decision and the second draft in such a quick and efficient manner. We appreciate it. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you. Um, Lanima, are there any points in the draft decision that you would like us to specifically review at this time? Not for me, no, thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Sullivan, are there any sections you'd like us to review? Just to, to touch on uh, what um, Mary mentioned, so the commission did issue a comment letter on June 8th, which commented on uh, a fee reduction for the, the conservation permitting fee. So that's outlined um, in that letter. And I'm happy to email that uh, directly to you too, if, if that'd be helpful. That, that would be helpful to me, Mr. Chairman. Can you explain what exactly the fee is that the commission agreed to waive? So, of course, so there's a, a filing fee um, under the, the wetlands uh, bylaw. And so it, it's based on land use and, and things like that. But so essentially the commission um, looked, uh, they issued a, a, re a reduced fee for uh, uh, Downing Square. So 19R Park Ave, just based on uh, the number of affordable units that were being built. So the commission used the same logic and agreed um, that a 20% a fee reduction uh, for the commission for the conservation filing fee would be appropriate. And so based on the applicant stated that uh, the fee uh, amounted to $15,000. And so the commission uh, was fine reducing it by 20% to $12,000. Thank you. Ms. Chapnick, were there any other points you would like the board to review at this time? Um, no, I, I'm very pleased with, um, with the collaboration and the way um, the findings and conditions have, have been drafted. I did have a procedural question, if I may. Please. Um, thank you. 
Um, I didn't I didn't understand where the waivers get recorded. Is that in the decision or is that in a separate document? Mr. Haverty? Mr. Haverty, can you address the question of waivers? I hope you're on mute. I apologize. I answered without realizing I was on mute. <clears throat> um, yeah, they, they would be added at the end of the decision. Okay, and um, I, I just would, would like to um, point out that at, at least for the wetlands regulation waivers, the letter that Emily referenced where we have the, the fee schedule in there, are our, our, our recommendation list of waivers to agree to as well. That's the June 8th letter and with justification for why. So if that's helpful in writing um, the decision. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Havity, we'll make sure that we get that to you. Thank you. At Laura Kraus, if she has anything further. Um, I think we covered everything. I just wanted to um, point out there were two waiver requests in the table um, that was submitted by Mary uh, that were not covered in our most recent letter. And, and I think therefore they were not also not covered in the commission's letter. Um, those waiver requests were not discussed in a previous letter, so we didn't address them. Uh, but based on our review of the documents, and uh, uh, we, it was our opinion that those waivers weren't needed and that they could be, um, that the findings could include that the, that the project meets the requirements of those provisions of the wetlands bylaw, and they have been reviewed and then included um, in the draft decision already, but just to point out that there were just two um, waiver requests that were not in our in our comment letter. And we oh. discussed this at the last meeting. There was some confusion there. So I just wanted to, I uh, figured it out. So I figured I'd clarify. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, appreciate that. Um, if, if I may just um, clarify, thanks Laura, that yeah. I, I didn't point that out, but our June 8th letter also shows exactly which waivers were, um, withdrawn by the applicant because mm -hmm. the Conservation Commission and BETA agreed that um, they were met. And I believe in the findings, um, the sections that Emily added to um, in, in the draft you have showing up here, Christian, that um, we have that information in there. So for example, um, section 25D, I think 25C, a few of those um, mm -hmm. for, uh, for the bylaw are, are in compliance now. And we stated, Emily added that language. Yeah. Okay, great. Perfect, thank you. Um, Ms. McGrath, were there any further comments from you? Uh, no, I think I'm all set, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. DeReuter, was there anything you wanted to add? No, I'm all set, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, so with that, I'd like to go ahead and ask if there's any more comments, then I will open this up for public comment. Um, so public comments and questions should be, will be taken as they relate to the matters at hand to be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Uh, to provide for an orderly flow and to allow for the inclusion of many voices, I ask individual speakers to try to limit their comments and encourage you to use your time to provide comments related to the indicated topics. Additional time may be provided at the discretion of the chair. The chair encourages the public to provide written comments to be reviewed by the board included in the record and in the decision. This is especially true if you have specific recommendations. Procedure for requesting to speak will be the same as for prior hearings. Please select the raise hand button from the comments tab on Zoom or dial star nine on your phone to indicate you'd like to speak. When called upon, please identify yourself by name and address. You'll be given time for your questions and comments. 
All questions should be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps us generate an accurate record. Once all public questions and comments have been addressed or time allocated by the chair has ended, public comment period will be closed for this session of the hearing. So we will do our best to show the section of the draft decision um, related to the question you'd like to ask. So the uh, first speaker uh, is Mr. Anessi. Uh, can you hear me now? We can, sir. I believe I was on mute. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, the meeting has uh, been very informative. Uh, I just find it very frustrating that we're now at the decision stage and we st still do not have a plan or a roadmap with respect to dealing with the utility pole. Now, even the, if you read H9 in the draft decision, there's a concession that the existence of the poll presents a safety issue. Well, that's been a safety issue all along. I've raised it certainly, and uh, hopefully to the point uh, where I've not been tiresome with the members of the board. If I have been, I apologize. Uh, I uh, have read uh, the substance of uh, H9, and I do have a concern with respect to the way it's framed. And I'll tell you what that concern is. Uh, my thinking is that there's been uh, a delay on the part of the applicant in dealing with the poll issue. And I say that because I contacted Verizon through Metro in New York some months ago and learned that the applicant had filed uh, some sort of a filing with Verizon uh, back in January. And the next step was that they were going to submit a plan. Uh, I, I called uh, uh, Verizon and I learned that they never in fact submitted that plan. So they never followed up on that at that point. They, they simply dropped it, okay? I have been raising this issue as I've indicated for some time. Now, if the uh, H9 suggestion is implemented and the matter gets continued to be kicked around and discussed uh, by uh, the applicant, uh, perhaps with me, perhaps with uh, members of the, uh, the board in the town, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is the zoning board is going to render a decision. And when they render that decision, I'm only going to have 20 days to file an appeal in the land court or superior court. Now, if you read H9, H9 takes us out far beyond that period of time. Discussions can continue beyond that period of time with respect to what's going to happen with the poll. I'm gonna to suggest to the members of the, uh, the board that enough time has gone by. It's time to pull the trigger with respect to what's going to happen with that poll. And quite frankly, uh, as, an, as the director about being impacted this, uh, by this, I'm frustrated that I keep hearing that we can't do this or we can't do that. Mr. Mills has suggested that the lines could go underline, uh, underground. I don't mind having the apparatus within my building taken off the walls if it has to come off the walls to get the line underground. I'm the most uh, directly impacted individual with respect to that event occurring. Something has to happen with the pole. Uh, my frustration also occurred because I don't believe that the town officials, gave, not the board now, uh, gave much thought to the poll. Engineering wrote a report, basically talked about a uh, bicycle path, talked about things happening in the right of way, not even mentioning the poll. The Arlington Transportation Committee did the same thing, not even mentioning the poll. I'm gonna suggest that maybe none of those individuals ever even took a ride down here as Mr. Mills did, and I believe you did, Mr. Klein, to take a view of the poll, how the poll impacted the right of way. I'm gonna just indicate to the members of the board that there has to be a decision on this. And there has to be a decision so that 
uh, when, this, when the decision does come down, uh, I can make a determination within that 20 day appeal period uh, as to what I'm going to do. Because quite frankly, if there's not a solution that protects my property and takes care of the safety issue as far as the right of way is concerned, I will be in the land court. I, I will be in superior court. I will not only contest the existence of the poll, I will also contest the overburdening of the private right of way. This is a private right of way, unlike Quinn Road, which is a public way. This is a private right of way, and I intend to do what I have to do to protect my rights in this private right of way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anessi. Um, just a, a quick question for Mr. Haverty. In regards to a condition like this, um, as it's written where it may not be resolved at the time the decision is filed, how does that impact an abutter's ability to file an appeal? Appeal has to be filed within 20 days of the board's decision being recorded with the town clerk. Okay. Um, again, the board is in a position where it is required to issue a decision based upon preliminary plans. That's part of the way chapter 40 d works. Um, you don't really have the authority in, in most instances to require additional information. The best you can do is address it through conditions and require it to be addressed on the final plans. Okay. Thank you. Mr. T. Good evening. This is Alex T of Two Rider Street. Uh, haven't had a chance to go through uh, the document in, in great detail, uh, but I would, I would love to get some more uh, insight into the discussions that happened uh, within the CBA uh, about kind of parking. Um, you know, I think you've heard from uh, many members of our community that were incredibly worried about the amount of parking um, and that waiver as, you know, again, a, a fair amount of research has been done, but if those assumptions don't hold true, that is going to be a persistent uh, uh, heartache uh, for our community um, if we're the ones that have to deal with it. I believe we've also, you know, voiced a lot of concern around the lack of language around how that's going to be managed. And we've requested on multiple occasions and multiple forums for more detail uh, about how that's going to be managed. Um, and especially around the, the language uh, of eviction and, and how unequitable that is in this time and age in terms of uh, uh, the, the consequence and, and who bears uh, the burden for that. So, so would love to understand kind of the discussions, if any, that were had uh, amongst the board in, in writing these conditions. Uh, and then secondly, I would also love to understand, you know, what recourse do we have as a neighborhood and a community uh, if these assumptions don't hold true? Um, you know, what are the forums and, and, and how does this get managed downstream? Again, you know, I think we all hope that their, their studies and, and everything, you know, play out as planned, um, but there's really no backup plan. Uh, and, that, and I guess that's the that's the thing that concerns us. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, in regards to, to the first question, in regards to discussions, so the board can only discuss um, in a public forum. So um, all the discussions the board has had specifically in regards to um, to these decisions has has, has happened um, over Zoom on these public meetings. Um, the next phase of this, um, once the pro once the public hearing phase is has been closed, um, then the board has 40 days to render its decision. Um, the, the deliberations the board takes during that period are also all fully public, um, but we are not allowed to take additional testimony during that time period. And so all the deliberations of the board will be, um, will be held publicly. Um, the question in regards to what recourses are available, I don't know, Mr. Haverty, can you can you, can you address that? Oh, you're on mute still. I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? Um, so the, the uh, Mr. T had asked the question about sort of what recourses are available to the abutters should the, the, the parking, um, should there be an issue with the way that the, sort of the number of parking spaces were out, were decided upon and that there is parking that is starting to occur in their neighborhood, what recourse did they have? Or I guess in general, what, you know, depending on what the decision rights is written, what recourse do they have in regards to the decision? 
Well, again, with regards to the decision, there's a 20 day appeal period that anybody that has standing you know, can file an appeal. Um, if at some point in the future, it, it's determined that the parking is insufficient um, and it's impacting neighboring properties, it's gonna be an enforcement issue uh, for the town. And where this is, a, where the abutting streets are, are private ways, um, but I don't believe the town has the ability to police those. Then it would be up to the owners of the private ways to have those vehicles removed. We will have to, we'll have to address that. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon, yes. Um, two things. W one is, I have the. I believe it is true that the issue of enforcement afterwards and what can and can't be done on a private way has been addressed earlier in the process. At, at some point, when it was cold and snowy instead of hot and humid. Um, but if we go back and look over, and if Mr. T does. Uh, I think there is something in the record that talks about that. Um, and secondly, obviously, if there is a parking issue in general, uh, and particularly since some portion of this, I gather, is, is owned by the, the public, uh, the board also has the ability to, uh, or at least arguably has the ability to control parking directly just as it would with any building in any parking situation that came up. Um, the other thing I wanted to just stress, because I, I, you mentioned it, Mr. Chairman, in your opening remarks, but I think that something underlying the way Mr. T presented it, I think it's important to realize that Mr. Haverty wrote this decision and the board did not. Uh, many of the things that are in it, the inserts and so forth, came from various agencies of the town or they came from suggestions of the applicant. Uh, but at this point, this is not a document of the board. It won't, or a successor won't become a document of the board until we decide to make it one uh, in, in the deliberation process. There's nothing to prevent us from just saying, you know, this doesn't work, we're, we're gonna say no. Um, so it's important to re recognize that this is not a board document yet. It is a draft for consideration by the board and it has to be viewed in that light. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. And Mr. Mr. Chair, this is, this is Alex. Sir, do you mind if I follow up on that real quick? Nope, I was just gonna call on you to do so. <laughs> so so I, I really appreciate that visibility. And new, being new to the process, I, I didn't really, I, I don't have a, a, a healthy appreciation for how this works. So I, I do appreciate that. Uh, and I think kind of going back to that awkward silence a couple minutes ago, this is just the, the concern for us is that no one really owns this. No one has truly figured out uh, how that enforcement is going to happen or be managed or at what point it becomes a problem. Uh, and so, you know, not too dissimilar from Mr. Inese's comment that it kind of just gets kicked around. Um, I'm, we are just concerned and I am just concerned that this is going to get kicked around and, and no one's going to have a plan. I'm not saying there can't be one, um, but because again, uh, everyone's kind of throwing up their hands that they don't own this tree, you know, enforcement's question. It's, it's a huge, huge gray area. And to ask for a waiver uh, kind of on, on a town ordinance without a plan in place, that's what concerns us, right? Um, right. And so I guess I don't know the, the best way to ask for that level of detail or to uh, you know, have the appropriate levels of accountability. Um, I, th I think, again, it's just really, it is such no man's land, uh, no person's land, excuse me, uh, that again, it, we're, we're all trying to figure this out and there's, uh, I'm sorry, the ZBA has to be the uh, <laughs> forum for that. So thank you for the time. No, Mr. absolutely. Mr. Chairman, may, may I just comment? Because this, there's no gray here. Um, I wrote a legal opinion that I submitted <clears throat> to the board. The town of Arlington owns the nine Ryder Street portion of the right of way. The Myracks own the even side portion of the right of way. There's nothing gray about it. The town owns it. Um, so um, I just want to make that clear. That was 
We provided that information um, by way of the Alta survey and by way of a legal opinion. So in that regard, are you saying that if someone parks on the even side of Ryder Street, that it is the it's the Myrex responsibility to have them removed? They could tell the Myrex, that's correct. If they park on the nine rider, it's virtually impossible to park on the even side because the abutters have encroached into Ryder Street. Mm -hmm. uh, the parking occurs on the odd side, which is owned by the town of Arlington. Okay. So, but it's, but it's still private way, even though it's owned by the town. That's, that's correct. Okay. Taking a note here, one second. Mr. Chairman, if I could just follow up on that. Um, Ms. O'Connor, is the consequence, suppose, suppose things didn't go the way we all hope and there's parking that is posing a difficult problem and it's occurring on the side that the, uh, that the town owns, but it is a private proprietor of rather than in its capacity as a, rather than as a public way. Could Mr. T or somebody else go to the town and say, we want you to put up no parking signs and if necessary, yeah, tow people away? Uh, and the town could, if it decided to do that, is that something they could do or not? They could do it. Um, it would be up to the select board to make that determination. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I continue to feel Mr. Anisi's pain. Um, and I'm now gonna risk displaying my ignorance here, but I'm gonna ask some straightforward questions that I hope the answers to are simple. I don't know. Um, Mr. Chairman, through you, who is currently the uh, owners of the property on which the development's going to occur? Um, ask Ms. O'Connor to answer that. Yes, um, the Myrak family, separate Myrak family than the Myrak dealership owns it through Arlington Center Corporation, I believe, Garage Corporation. They are not the same families. Okay, uh, thank you. That that. Hmm. Okay, because my next question was going to be simply, so who are the owners of the uh, Myrak dealership? When you say not the same families, you mean... Uh, One is the, the Myrak Chevrolet Hyundai dealership is owned by Edward Myrak. Um, right. The other brother, and they're separate and distinct. Okay. Uh, I understand that they are separate branches of the family, just like there were branches of the Damulas family for a market basket, and their arguments went on between families for many years. Um, I'm wondering simply why it is that the Myraks, between the branches of their family, can't figure out a way to relocate the pole on their property, the, My the Edward Myrak property that's different than the development. I know that they're branches of the family, but it strikes me as that's a real simple solution to the poll issue that Mr. Anisi has, um, if it can truly be brought to ground. And I don't disagree, Mr. Moore, but it has not happened so far. And there have been discussions. Could those discussions, because as I say, I uh, believe, uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe that Mr. Anisi act, has a very valid issue here. And if, if he does go and pursue his options, like he says he might, it will prolong difficulty here with this project. And I'm wondering if the efforts with the branches of the Myrak family could be redoubled to bring this issue of the poll and location to closure. That's my comment, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. I'm looking for new public comment. Uh, Mr. Anessi, I believe your hand is still raised yeah. from earlier. Yeah, is that correct? I'm, I'm, I'm finished. I'm done. Yep. Yeah. No. Oh. 
Is there anyone else from the public who would like to speak to this matter? I'm gonna please either raise your hand or if you're on the phone, you can dial star nine. Otherwise, I'm gonna look at people's pictures and if anyone is waiting frantically, we will call upon them. I do not see anybody waving. So with that, I will go ahead and close public comment for this evening. Okay, so the, there are a couple of, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing this for now and share something different. So this is, so our current schedule, so we are right now on Monday, July 19th, and the 23rd is when the public hearing is scheduled to be closed. So we are um, going to be discussing um, the continuation of this hearing and also the extension um, of the review period. Uh, so I had spoken with uh, Mary O'Connor earlier today about the possibility of extending to Thursday, July 29th, um, so 10 days from today, which would give uh, the public uh, more time to review the draft. It would give us a chance to um, have some of the comments that were uh, discussed this evening incorporated into the draft and um, to make sure that we have all the documentation that the, the board has all the documentation it's looking for, all the information it needs in order to um, deliver a decision so that we can close the public comment period. Um, it's not the public comment, excuse me, the public hearing. So uh, we would be looking to continue to Thursday, July 29th at 7.30 p.m. Is there uh, anyone from the board or uh, from the applicant or consultants who would be unable to participate on that date? like that's probably going to be an okay date. Um, <clears throat> and then would the board be comfortable uh, having Friday the 30th as being the close of the public, the, uh, as the extension of the public hearing period, or would we want to extend that further than the 20th of July? Is it always or depends if anyone thinks that we're not going to be able to close on the 29th. Sorry, Mr. Klein. Mr. Ford. If I could jump in here. I, I do always like to see an extra week okay. on your last scheduled date, just in case something happens. There's a thunderstorm that knocks out power. Um, anything that would cause the board to be unable to actually meet on the 29th, it would give mm -hmm. the ability to regroup and schedule a meeting for the next week. So that's why I generally like to see an additional week beyond the last scheduled hearing date. Okay, all right, thank you. Mr. Ford, sorry. Yeah, I was trying to look at my calendar and I'm traveling that day, so I won't be able to make next Thursday the 29th for okay. Mr. Ford, have you missed any of the other hearings on 1165R? Just one, but I rewatched the uh, okay uh, the hearing. But it might not be necessary that I'm that I'm at it since I'm not necessarily a uh, full. Yeah, but movie. it would if you missed it. Since you've already missed one, if you missed a second, it would preclude you is, the, is more the issue. Um, but we would still have five um, because Ms., um, Mr. O'Rourke has also had, unfortunately he's had his, he's having his second miss, um, but that would still leave us with five members who have been present for all the, hear for all the hearings. So we would be able to proceed
Um, so then my question to the board then is, are they comfortable with proceeding on the 29th or should we find a different date so that Mr. Ford can attend? Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Uh, I, I, I hate to lose, uh, you know, two people so that if anything, I mean, suppose the reason we couldn't have our meeting is that Mr. Revelock got hit by lightning, then we would be stuck. Uh, so I want, I'm wondering if, uh, so the only really option that we have is to, uh, as a practical matter, is to go over to the following week. And the following week, we have a very big hearing on the other 40B on Tuesday. Right. And we'd end up having to meet twice. And the question, I guess, is whether anybody has the is prepared to to do that if not i guess we have to stick with the 29th and then i would suggest on mr haverty's uh, advice to make the expiration happen on Feb on the 6th which is the following friday mr haverty were you available on wednesday the 28th i don't know if we discussed that date earlier mr chairman i am available on wednesday the 28th Everyone else available on Wednesday the 28th? Mr. Ford, does that help you? No, oh, I'm sorry. I'm traveling Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, the 27th, 28th, and 29th. So oh, I think that's okay. 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 All right, then. Um, how about? Monday the 26th, is that even a possibility? I could do that. You could do that. I'm also fine with that date. Mr. Haverty, is that a possibility? Yeah, it's my birthday though. Oh no! <laughs> well, That's we can do that, we can handle that. That we work really great at singing over <laughs> <Yeah>. her. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I'm pretty sure the uh, participants tab has a button for that. <laughs> no, we can do that. You sure? Yep. Mary, does that work for you? That's fine. Thank okay. you. Okay. We would be looking at Monday, July 26th. 7.30. And then with that then, um, push out an extra week. So we would look to be closing um, on August 2nd. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Just to be clear, when we say the closing is August 2nd, what we mean is the outside date to actually close is there and not that we're, at, we're going to meet again on the 2nd to do that. So it's very likely that if everything goes according to plan, the closing will happen on the, tw will actually happen on the 26th, even though we have one week leeway. Is that correct? Thank you, yes. that's. Absolutely correct. I guess, was that the right date? Yep. Uh, So we would be looking to extend the hearing, the public hearing period until August 2nd and continue till Monday, July 26th. 
um, just to start uh, members of the board sort of thinking about this. So 40 days from July 29th, which we're now backing up by three days. So would be um, Labor Day weekend would be the end of the 40 day period. So we should consider um, how we would want to have possible discussions. Um, as I mentioned before, unfortunately I am completely unavailable August 7th through the 21st, but um, we, could have a, we could have a meeting over Zoom on the Tuesday the 24th um, to discuss things and we could try to meet around the September 2nd. Um, that's a possibility. Trying to stay away from that week after because September 9th is a continue is Thorndike Place again. And then the following week, the 14th, is um, we have a new hearing as well with a possible extended continuation of Thorndike Place onto September 14th. So um, we don't we don't need to resolve these dates today, but just for members of the board to have put those have those in mind um, going forward. So with that, um, is there any further discussion about the extension and the continuance? Seeing none. Okay, I have a motion to extend the public hearing period to Monday, August 2nd. So moved. Thank you, do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. And a vote of the board. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Revelak? Aye. Uh, Mr. Ford? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So the public hearing period is extended to Monday, August 2nd, 2021. And then a motion to continue the public hearing for 1165 R Massachusetts Avenue to Monday, July 26, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. So moved. Mr. Hanlon. Second. Thanks, Mr. DuPont. Go to the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Revlack. Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So we are continued on 1165R Massachusetts Avenue until Monday, July 26th, uh, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, so I'll just leave up here on the screen just the upcoming uh, dates in case anybody has any questions about our upcoming schedule. That in mind, I would like to thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. Especially wish to thank um, Rick Valorelli, Vincent Lee, and Kelly Linema for all their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's reporting the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It's our understanding the recordings made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to ZBA at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Do I have a second? Thank you, Mr. Mills. Go to the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Revelak. Aye. Mr. Ford. Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's patience and all your efforts. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all.